Well, good morning, Discovery Online. How are you guys doing today? As you've probably heard us talk about for the past few weeks, today we are having an outdoor service. Now, we thought about trying to live stream that directly, but we ran into enough technical hurdles that we thought, you know what? We're giving our best for God and that will not be it. So today you've got something a little bit different, but a couple of things before we jump into that. If you're watching online, first of all, hi, how are things going? Say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're watching from and maybe say hi to somebody else once you see them as well. That's if you're watching on dfchurch.com or if you are watching on YouTube, either way, we'd love for you to say hi. Let us know where you are now. As I mentioned, there's a few changes coming for you guys as well. You've also probably heard us talk about how starting next week until Labor Day, we're going to only be doing a 1030 service. Now, if you're watching this at 9 a.m. or 1030, you who watch at 1030, it's going to be no different. But you nine o'clock people, there won't be anything playing here at 9 a.m. It will only be at 1030 for our live stream as well, since that's our one service. That will also be our one live stream. Now, what are you going to do with all that extra time? You know, you can go out and grab breakfast first. You can go out, invite a friend to breakfast. Maybe, you know, we've talked a lot about reaching out into our communities, reaching to our neighbors. So maybe it's you You find a neighbor who you don't know that well and you say you want to grab breakfast today and then you can always invite them to come and watch with you at 1030 or just see where they are, get to know them. That would be a really cool thing. Now, we are going to jump over to Mickey Lang. Mickey is our next gen director. He is for the first time preaching today. He's preaching right now in our outdoor service. Uh, so what we did is we had a little chance to pre-record that message. So I'll cut it over to Mickey. But as always, please let us know. Um, contact at dfchurch.com. You can email us. Again, that's contact at dfchurch.com. I would love to hear from you about your thoughts on the live stream as we move into kind of this 1030 only time. Uh, what are the things that you love about the live stream? What kind of stuff could we improve upon? What are your overall thoughts on this live stream? Let us know. Again, contact at dfchurch.com and I will be back right after Mickey. Good morning and welcome to our June 30th service. Today we're outdoors and so we're doing things a little bit different. This is actually pre-recorded uh, a couple days before our service so that you online have something that you can watch as well and follow along in our passage in Revelation. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's get started. Boromir thought he could but he couldn't. Denethor fell to the lie that he could but then he fell to his death in the effort. Edmund thought he was crafty enough to fool a queen and ended up her slave. Tony Stark thought he could do it by himself and ended up losing half of the universe. Achilles believed in himself but got tripped up by his pride. Scar thought he was strong enough to shoulder the burden, but the lion's share, it wasn't his to take. Anakin wanted to bring stability to his empire, but he lost himself in the fray. There are plenty of examples of people and characters and even lions who thought they had what it took to make the world right, to stop the injustices, but they were all proven wrong. They were all proven wrong even at their demise in some cases. We look at them and we say, no, that's not the way. Our hearts break for them, our frustration builds with them. Maybe we didn't even like their character from the start. but. Even if we did like them, even if they did succeed, they usually have flaws in their character that taint the victories that they get. We have no shortage of fallen heroes or false victories, and yet we hunger and we look for and we thirst for the one who's able to put everything right again forever. We want it so bad that we take it into our own hands. People like Adam and Eve, Cain, Abraham, Jacob, Pharaoh, David, Alexander the Great, the Maccabees, the Caesars, the Apostle Peter, Hitler, Stalin, Timothy McVeigh, Eric Harris, Dylan Klebold, Bush, Clinton, Grandpa, Bonnie Lang, Mickey Lang. Our hands just are not big enough 
to take the world into them, to bend the universe to our will. But we try time and time again, and we fail over and over again. It's a ruthless cycle that we go through. Luckily, that cycle's not all there is to it. We're going to be looking in Revelation today, Revelation chapter 5, to see where our hope can be found. If it's not in our hands, whose hands is it in? So let's read through Revelation 5. We're going to do the whole chapter. Verse 1. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping! Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings, and among the 24 elders... He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and the elders And they sang a mighty chorus. Worthy is the lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the Lamb. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the revelation you gave to John. I thank you for being the great God who holds this whole universe in his hands, sustaining it and making sure it runs according to your will. I pray that you open our hearts and our minds to what you have to say today. And I ask that you would just bless us with a word from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so to give you some background, Revelation 4 describes this throne room. And it is spectacular. There is the one sitting on the throne, and it's shining, and there are lights, and there are colors, and there are angels, hosts of angels all over the place. And there are four living beings that have these animal-like features, And they have eyes all over, and there are 24 elders all in this throne room, and they're worshiping God, and it's nothing but glorious. And John sees this. And then we start in chapter 5 with verse 1. Then I saw a scroll in the hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. So in this chapter, the first thing that John notices is that there is someone sitting on the throne. And who is that someone but God the Father? Moving on to verse 2. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and reread it. So why is this such a big deal? 
what's on this scroll that makes John weep bitterly? He recognizes that it's a big deal. He recognizes the importance of this scroll. And it breaks his heart that no one can be found on the earth, in heaven, or under the earth who's able to read it. This scroll, we find out, contains the outpouring of God's justice on the world in seven different steps. So it's the will of God that has not yet been carried out on the earth, but is going to be. God has written it down, and he doesn't write things down lightly. Let's move on to verse 5. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Now I want to ask you the question that every Sunday school kid should be able to answer. Who's the lion of Judah? It's Jesus. Who's the heir to David's throne? It's Jesus. Who has won the victory? It's Christ Jesus. So who is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals? It's Jesus, God's son, God the son. Let's continue with verse six. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. It was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. Now, remember, John has seen this great throne room with God the Father on the throne, with the crazy-looking living beings around the throne, and the 24 elders surrounding the throne. And now this slaughtered lamb comes into play, comes onto the scene with its seven horns and its seven eyes, and it stands before the throne among the 24 elders this would be a bizarre sight. This would be eye-catching. Now, this lamb that had seven horns and seven eyes, I imagine that not many people have seen a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. But the horns, they display the power of this lamb. They display the fact that he is coming to rule. The horns go before the ark when it's entering a place to announce the power and glory and the might of the, the authority behind it. Horns were blown at the fall of the wall of Jericho to announce the fact that God is mighty and powerful and the walls of a city could not hold him out. They're meant to explain that there's power coming. Horns on animals and on creatures are meant to show the power and glory of that, that creature. The beasts in Daniel, they had horns. Horns are the dangerous part of the animal. The saying, don't mess with the bull or you'll get the horns, is there for a reason. And then we have the eyes, the seven eyes. And John describes these eyes as being the sevenfold spirit of God. There are a couple of interpretations, and we could definitely throw ourselves into the weeds trying to figure out exactly what it is. One interpretation is that it's the seven seven aspects of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, intelligence, counsel, strength, knowledge, piety, fear of God. And another interpretation is that they are seven angelic beings who carry out God's will across the earth. The point of these seven eyes being on the Lamb is that the Lamb of God is seeing out the will of God through the Spirit. That Jesus Christ is seeing out the will of God through the sending of the Holy Spirit to the ends of the earth. So let's continue, verse 7. He stepped forward, this is the lamb, and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp. And they held gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God. And they will reign on the earth. Let's read that again and be absolutely clear who the elders are talking about. 
You, the lamb, the slaughtered lamb, are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you, the lamb, was slaughtered. And your blood, the lamb's blood, has ransomed for people, God, or sorry, has ransomed people for God and every tribe, from every tribe, and language, and people, and nation. And you, the slaughtered lamb, have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Remember, this scroll that the Lamb took is the will of God that has yet to be fulfilled on and in the world. And these beings, the four living beings and the 24 elders, recognize that it is only the slaughtered Lamb who is able to bring about that will. This is exciting. This is good news. This is the reason that John was weeping and told not to weep, because there is someone who can open the scroll. Jesus Christ, the slaughtered lamb, the lion of Judah, the heir to the throne of David, who has come to take and did take the sins of the world, stepped up to take the scroll and send forth the Spirit of God to complete the task of rescuing us from ourselves and redeem the world that he created. This is good news. This is exciting news. Let's continue with chapter, or with verse 11. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and of the living beings and elders, and they sang a mighty chorus. Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, everybody, they sang. Blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living beings said, Amen. Not just Amen, but Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped the Lamb. And that's where chapter 5 ends. This slaughtered lamb is ascribed honor in heaven, right alongside the one sitting on the throne. Jesus, our Savior, is on the same level as the one sitting on the throne. He descended to live as we do, but to do it perfectly, only to be led to the slaughter for speaking truth to the people he came to save. They took it into their own hands to silence him, not realizing even though they were told over and over that it was coming, and even though they should have known that this was what God had planned from the very beginning. This is the Lamb who is able to take the scroll and see that the will of God is done. But this crazy vision from two millennia ago was intense, and it was worthy of writing down and sending out to the people who believe that Jesus is who he said he was, but what does it mean for us? How do we apply it to our own lives? Well, I have an idea. Uh, let, let's use an, an acronym. And this acronym is a word that comes from my son's books about dinosaurs. And in the, in the dinosaur books, um, the dinosaurs usually announce themselves with a loud sound, and it's a roar. R-A-W-R. So our first R from our RAR is for recognize. We want to recognize that God is there on the throne. We tend to forget that there's a sovereign God in control of everything that happens. The spinning of the world, the rotation of the galaxies, the fact that we sneeze when we do. God's in control of all of it. We tend to remain ignorant of the fact that people are part of the created but people are not the creator. We need to recognize and adjust our thinking that ultimately we are not in charge. We are not the ones who are sitting on the throne. It's God the Father sitting on the throne. So that's R. The R is for recognize that God is there on the throne. The A in our RAR is for accept. We need to accept that the future is not in our hands. Now, this is a hard one for us as human beings. We tend to strive to do what we can to bring up futures, bring our own futures and the futures of others under our control. We work hard, 
We save and invest for retirement. We make plans for our kids' lives and try to prepare them to be social contributors to, to everything that's going on in the world and in a positive fashion. We build skills to get ahead in our job. We try to live healthy lives in order to extend our time here on earth. We tend to see these immediate needs, immediate meaning within the 60 to 100 years that we typically have on this earth, and we take those needs and we make them the priority over God. We, we need to accept that all of those needs, even though they're not bad or sinful in and of themselves, they're ultimately not in our hands. God decides whether we even take a breath the following day. We need to accept that the future is God's, and he allows us to be a part of it. So the R, the first R, is for recognize. We need to recognize that God is on the throne. He is in charge. The A is for accepting that the future is not in our hands. God grants us a future. We don't take a future. And then we come to W. The W stands for worship God and his greatness. We tend to worship and praise our successes, and then we dwell in our depression. We just wallow in our misery because something hasn't gotten, gone right for us. We tend to forget that all things were created by God and for his glory. So we need to worship. We need to worship God and remember that he is the one to whom we should be giving glory because he has given us all of this world, this universe to enjoy and explore, the flowers we enjoy smelling, the food we enjoy eating, the relationships we have with our family and friends, the relationships we will have later on in our lives. God gives those to us. He's the one who planned and executed that plan to save us from ourselves. We chose to walk away from God, and God and his goodness, his greatness, and his love went after us to rescue us. We need to worship God for his greatness. So we have R for recognize that God's on the throne. We have A for accept that the future is not in our hands, and we have W for worship God and his greatness. And we have our final R. We need to rejoice. Rejoice in the fact that the lamb who was slain holds the future in his hands. We tend to get bogged down by the hard things in life, that depression I was talking about. We tend to fall in the rut of going through the day-to-day minutia of work, eat, work, sleep, eat, work, sleep, and do it all again the very next day. Or for church life, arrive a little late, sing a song or two, get distracted during the message, Say hey to those that you haven't seen for a week. Go home, eat lunch, and then do it all again the next week. We get caught up in this cycle. We tend to fall out of the joy we should have in knowing the truth of the gospel. The gospel being that we are sinners, but God loved us so much that he sent his son to live a perfect life, to die as a sacrifice for us, and then to be raised again to show that all he said was true. And that includes that He's coming back to take us home. We need to rejoice because death is defeated by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And while there is still a lot coming, as we saw with the scroll that has yet to be unrolled, it's in the hands of the only one who can open it. It's in the proper hands. Jesus, the slaughtered lamb, the one who will bring forth the end of suffering for his people, is our savior And he is the one who's going to carry out God's will. So we have, there we have it. RAR. R. For recognize that God's on the throne. A. For accept the fact that the future is not in our hands, but in God's hands. W. We need to worship God and his greatness because he's given us all of this. And R. We need to rejoice that because it's in the hands of the slaughtered lamb, that it's going to happen. The end of all tears, the end of all weeping for God's people, that's coming to an end because it's in the hands of the one who can carry out the will. So again, RAR, 
If you're feeling bold enough, say it loud. Make it so that your neighbors can hear it. Roar! Remember, our future is not in our hands. God has given us the opportunity to walk with him. But ultimately, it's in the slaughtered lamb's hands. The one who can and will carry out the will of God. It's in the hands of the one who was tempted and perfectly overcame the sin of the world out of love for his creation. Us, the slaughtered lamb, Jesus, God the Son. It's in his hands. It's out of our hands. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you for today again. God, I thank you that you are the one who is in control. God, I ask that we would act wisely and realize that you are the one who is in control. And while you may have called us to some difficult tasks, um, you are there with us always. Um, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us, making him worthy to take the scroll into his hands and to carry out your will. I pray that as we go out this week that we would remember that and we would recognize it, we would accept it, we would worship you, and we would rejoice in the fact that that is the way it is. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. That was such a great message. Now, like I said, normally we're going to have the music and all that. Today's a little bit different. But what I'd like to do now is I'm going to put up a few discussion questions on the screen. Those questions can be used to go a little bit deeper. Again, we don't want the Sunday morning service to be the end goal, but rather the jumping off point. So if we can get that message internalized a little bit, maybe think through some of the ramifications and then put those into practice into our life, that will make such a huge impact on our community around us. So I'm going to put those questions up. And um, before we go, as always, don't forget, if you'd like to support the ministry of Discovery Fellowship Church, you can visit dfchurch.com and click that give but now here are those discussion questions. I'm going to just put them up for a few minutes. You can go ahead and pause there. Um, and we will see you next week for our regularly scheduled service at 1030. See you then.